Yeah, welcome everyone to the next session. Very, yeah, very looking forward to hearing the next talk from David, uh, David Lewin about access to prosperity, quantifying infrastructure impact with OpenStreetMap. And he's going to talk a little bit. Yeah, I learned before that he's traveling a lot, so I'm very looking forward in doing uh, yeah, amazing things, developing software for different kind of, yeah, to address different kind of challenges, now specifically looking at the impact of the lack of infrastructures and how we can actually, the impact of actually overcoming these challenges as well. Yeah, and I'll give the floor to you. Great, thank you for the introduction, Melanie. Um, so yeah, my name is Davy Lovin, and today I'm going to talk about quantifying infrastructure impact with OpenStreetMap. Um, and so my agenda today, I'm going to talk about some community development projects that I've been working on in Eswatini. Um, and I'm also going to talk about how we're using data analysis and OpenStreetMap to help maximize our impact in those projects. And I'm also, that will lead to talking about this Python package that I've written in order to help quantify infrastructure impact and how you can also use that yourself. So first of all, uh, where is Eswatini? And I'm just curious, how many people here know where Eswatini or Swaziland is? All right, yeah, good show, everybody. Um, and then I guess for those who don't know, uh, it's down here um, in Southern Africa. It's this cute little country nestled in between South Africa and Mozambique. Um, and Swaziland, also Eswatini, it's, it's quite a small country. Um, in fact, it's about, double the circumference of the London metro area. So not a huge country, but for what it lacks in size, it makes up for in hills. So this is just a map of the terrain ruggedness, and you can see the left part of the country, or the west, uh, is super hilly, um, and it's just, when you go on the ground in Swaziland, this is what you see. It's just hills, and you've got a lot of cattle, and all of these little homesteads kind of dotted on the hillside. So also, in addition to a lot of hills, uh, Swaziland has got a lot of rivers. Um, and I'm going to focus on this little portion right here um, in Swaziland. In fact, this is the backyard of the house that I was staying at for the last couple months. I took this picture about two months ago, uh, or sorry, two weeks ago. Um, and this is the winter. Um, and you can see over to the left here, you've got this uh, little river going by. Um, and it's the dry season, so the river's not so high. Um, but I just want you guys to focus on that little slide in the background there. This is what it looks like in the rainy season. So the rivers swell like crazy and it becomes quite an issue. In fact, I love trail running right across the river, but in the summer I just can't get there because the rivers are so wide. It just rains all the time. Um, and so that's a little bit of an issue for me, but for a lot of people in Swaziland, it's actually a big issue for them to get to their nearest uh, services. In particular, this is a news article about river flooding and people not being able to get to school for about two weeks. So it's a little issue for me, but for a lot of other people, it's a big one. And this is exacerbated by the lack of proper infrastructure in order to get over these rivers. Um, and this is just a, a picture of what some river crossings really do look like typically, just really makeshift crossings that are really inadequate um, for providing traffic year round. So, with that in mind, um, a few friends of mine about three years ago, we heard of this need and we decided that we wanted to do something about it. This is a group of us. We were university students at the University of Colorado and we kind of sent it to Swaziland to see if we can help address these challenges. Uh, we went to the communities uh, and we visited. We heard about their need. We did technical surveys with our survey equipment. And then we had the great fortune of meeting this organization called Swaziland Microprojects, which is a governmental organization that we partnered with, with funding and other resources in order to implement some footbridges for the country. Super dope. So we ended up breaking ground about a year later on our first footbridge in Swaziland. And that was a really just overall amazing Amazing time, amazing program. Um, and, you know, actually, I'm just gonna. This is, I, I want you guys to also get an idea of what it is like to. Um, to be in these community projects because we're not a major developmental organization. We are straight up mixing concrete by hand with community members and we are building these footbridges um, with the people on the ground. So we're not a huge organization, we are just about the people. Um, and so 
In the end, we got ourselves a footbridge and it was a humongous success. And then we built another and another. And overall, so far, we have six footbridges that we've built in the country so far. And as far as the theme of this conference being bridging the map, we've officially added six footbridges to the map so far and counting. So now what though? So we've started these programs and we want to build all these footbridges to provide access to the entire country, but the way that we were going wasn't in a sustainable, kind of scalable way. So we decided to kind of scale up our efforts and change the, our approach in order to really solve this problem for the whole entire country. So to do that, we want to develop a partnership structure and perform a national needs assessment. I'm going to focus on this national needs assessment because it's really relevant to OpenStreetMap. So when you perform a national needs assessment, you've got to figure out where is there a need for footbridges in the entire country. So the way that we used to do it would be we would just hear of footbridge need kind of through the grapevine and then we would visit and we'd meet with these people, go to the bridge site and see if there was a need, go for all the technical analysis. But you know, it, it works and it's great but it's really time consuming. You end up spending all day and as much as I love hanging out in the rural areas and you know, going to people's homesteads, you know, we really, if we want to figure out this problem on the whole entire country scale, we're going to need a new approach. So that new approach um, is all powered by OpenStreetMap. So what we do is we visit these Tinkunla meetings and here we have the 59 Tinkunla in the country and every Tuesday they gather together for development. We go there, we present our projects and we record the long lats of the potential bridges that these local leaders have identified. So this is literally, I mean, this is just what it looks like. We sit down with these local leaders and they show us where they need infrastructure. They also show us where they would be going, crossing at that infrastructure. And then they also tell us things like flood prone bridges, which will be crucial to our uh, flood models that we do later on. And we take all this stuff and we put it into OpenStreetMap. We're also training some local guys, like this is my man Sibanisa right here, to do this. And in fact, they are doing it as we speak for the entire country. And the second part is these traveling salesman site visits. Um, and it's not like we've figured out the routes with the traveling salesman algorithm. We're really just traveling around, kind of selling these footbridges to the local leaders. Um, and we've been able to get our efficiency up to about four sites that we can visit per day, whereas it was one before, just by scheduling all of these sites in a row. And we uh, navigate to these sites with OSM Android, um, and we're using ODK for the on the ground assessments. So yeah, we record all sorts of information at each site, including a technical and social survey, and we collect a lot of site media for every place that we visit. Uh, and yeah, this is just what it looks like. It's a beautiful country. So the third part about it is the footbridge impact analysis, which is what I'm going to focus on here today. So after going to all these bridge sites, we have a ton of these potential sites and we have a bunch of technical and social data. And what we really want is a prioritized list of sites. We don't know what will happen in the future. We want to really prioritize the ones that are most important and so that we can address those first. Um, but then collected impact data is unreliable. If you ask people how many people are impacted by the footbridge, they're going to be, you know, saying a lot of people because they know that the more impact, the more likelihood that we will build the bridge there. So we want a deterministic approach to figure out the impact of these footbridges. So I'm going to show you guys what we're doing and I'm going to do a little example here, this little region of the country down yonder. So here we have a satellite view of a community, Etlecheni in Swaziland, and, and you can see here we've got this big river coming through, the Nguempisi River, uh, and we've got all of these cute little homesteads dotted on the hillside, that's an orange. And then we've also got a route network, so these are all the little roads and the dotted lines are all the pathways. Um, and of particular importance for these models are the fords. And so for those of you who don't know, the fords are where highways meet waterways and there's no infrastructure you know, like a bridge, say. And so we were brought to this particular ford by a community leader who said they really have an issue going to Tsawela Primary School across the river amongst other places um, and that they wanted a footbridge here so that they could increase access to this primary school. 
So in order to run, uh, to understand the impact that we would have by building this footbridge here, we're going to do a routing scenario comparison. We're going to compare a normal access model with a flood access model to answer the question, what impact does a flood have on this region? And then we're going to compare a flood model with a bridge model, which would say, what impact does a bridge have in event of a flood? So here, we're gonna run normal versus flood scenario. So this is a normal scenario where these fords are crossable. And say the water is low, you can hop from rock to rock, and it's not a huge issue, though it is an inconvenience. We're gonna compare that to a flood scenario where those, uh, those fords are blocked and people can no longer cross there. So the houses in green uh, are the ones that the model has said they are have a different it's different between a normal and flood scenario. So these are homesteads that are impacted by a flood. And you can see that by looking at the routes. So these green routes, when routed, or green homesteads, when routed to the primary school, you know, they can go just straight across these fords without an issue. And that's the way that they would go to the school um, the fastest route. But then when you look at the flood affected routes, I mean, they've got to go all the way up to the top of the screen, over to the main road and down. And uh, though I don't have a scale here, that's about seven, eight kilometers. And so uh, often these children just don't go to school because it's such a long walk. Um, and so next we're gonna do a scenario of flood versus bridge. Um, so here again we have the flood scenario where all those fords are blocked, but then we're gonna upgrade that one ford to a bridge and see what happens. So the purple homesteads are the ones that it shows are affected by a bridge. Um, and these are the routes that they would take in flood, similar to what they were just before. Um, and then when you put a bridge in, as you can see, they all can go across the bridge and that is their shortest route to get to that primary school. So on top of being able to visualize the difference in between flood and in between bridges, it's really nice, um, oh, actually before I say that, I just wanna show that there's a difference between the flood versus bridge scenario and the bridge versus flood scenario. So the green homesteads are impacted by a flood, but they're not impacted by the bridge. And you can see these guys on the right here, they aren't impacted by the bridge because they would have to cross that first ford um, before they'd get to the bridge. So it's just, it's an interesting way to visualize the dynamics of of flood and access in a particular place. So on top of the visualization, we get this data that we can use to answer questions like how much time and distance is saved for each homestead on average. So we have the flood or the normal distance, the normal time, the flood and the bridge, and we can compare that to answer the question, what's the average time saved? How many homesteads are impacted? And start to answer more complicated questions. Just load that thing into R and have a, a field day with all that data. So, when I was running this analysis, when I was running this scenario stuff, I thought to myself, this is, I'm not the only person out there that wants to run routing scenarios. And so I decided, like, I'm gonna build a Python package for the good of the open source community because I love you guys, so that if anyone wants to do similar routing analysis, it will be super duper easy. So I created Tebe Tebe, which is, Tebe Tebe, which is, means footbridge in Saswati. And it's a wrapper, a Python API around the open source routing machine so you guys can run routing analysis super easy. And I'm gonna show you guys real quick how it works. So here we have a scenario schematic and uh, all of these bubbles here are classes within the Python API. So you've got a routing profile that can be either car, bicycle, or in my case that I just used, it would be a flood profile. And then you've got an OSM data set that could be a, an, a geofabric extract or that can be an overpass query. Um, and then you pipe those into a scenario. That will show you, you know, a routing scenario for a particular data set. Then in Python, you call the scenario, which compiles it, and then it provides a context manager to serve the HTTP API so that you can query the scenario and get routes and tables, all the things that you would want when you're doing routing. Um, and then in that scenario API, you can you know, uh, run origins and destinations um, with POI data sets. Um, and the way that I've written it as well, you can, you can uh, create a POI data set from anything from an OGR, so like a shape file or an overpass query, and you can uh, pipe in an OSM data set from a PBF file or overpass. And so what this allows you to do is really, you can very much just with various overpass queries, pull a route network and then pull the POIs and then run this routing on the fly. 
So in particular before, like I said, the foot profile um, and the normal scenario, this is what it looked like. I just foot profile with the Swaziland PBF, I piped that into the Swazi foot scenario, uh, called it, it's an API, and then the origins of the homesteads and the destinations were the schools. The flood scenario is a similar sort of thing. The only thing that's different is the flood profile. And I want to zoom up real quick on this flood profile because I think it's really neat to see what the difference was. I just took the normal profile for walking and I added a way handler and a node handler. Super simple, super readable. You can just see here, if bridge is yes, flood prone equals yes, return false, right? Like don't route here. Um, if the block, if uh, forward equals yes, it's a barrier. Super simple, super readable. I really like OSRM because of this, and I think it's a really readable, re reproducible routing analysis, so I would love if you guys want to use it. And here's a little script just to see what's going on. It's super simple. You initialize the scenario with the PBF file and like a default foot profile and then with the scenario and then the parentheses you call it, it returns itself, provides a context manager so that you can query it with the routing. I, you know, I'm not doing something super novel here. I'm just making it really easy for people to run routing scenarios um, because it was a bit complex when I was looking to do it first myself. And that's what it will tell you, this particular example. It gives you just a quick little duration um, and distance. So the features right now, it's got a, the core of it is this OSRM scenario API that you can call um, and it's super easy to, you know, start up a routing engine. Um, it's also got accessibility isochrones. Um, it does route comparison, um, which will allow you to do just what I did before. In fact, all the example of the code and the results that I have are now online on the examples, so you can check that out. Um, and it provides a bit of an analysis pipeline, which just makes it easy just to grab the data, pull it all in, do the analysis, and spit out something useful. Um, I would like to implement shared memory, which would be neat, which is where you can, uh, you know, update the node and edge weights in real time, um, and so you don't have to recompile the scenarios. Uh, I'd like to do Osmium filters, um, which could allow programmable updates of the network, would be really neat. Parallelization and all this other wish list sort of stuff. And I'm continuing development uh, on this, even though it's been, I mean, it serves the purposes for me, but I'm just going to do it because I have a feeling somebody might want it out there. Um, the caveats of this all, I just want to mention the HTTP API, which it takes in order to uh, query for a particular route. It, it introduces a lot of overhead. If you're going to be running a bajillion requests, you're going to be having a lot of a bottleneck with all these HTTP requests. Um, there's a bunch of I.O. between uh, the OSM data and then writing the scenarios. And also the default routing profiles, you really got to be careful. I mean, look over here. You see these guys that are crossing the river and then crossing it back to get to the, the school. I mean, that's not realistic. I should definitely go in there and then have a time delay for forward equals yes. I just want you all to be careful and not just run it with the default profile and you're like, oh, wow, I got some results. You know, you really got to look into it. So check out the docs. I uh, wrote a bunch of documentation, a bunch of script examples um, so that, you know, some of you might find it useful and then be able to use it. Um, and I would love if you did. If you do, you should just holler at me because it would totally make my day. Um, so yeah, great. Made it to the end of the talk, thank goodness. Um, uh, and yeah, real quick acknowledgements. Um, I want to acknowledge you all people. Everything that I written was completely open source and you know, written by the open source community. I'm just building, I'm on the shoulders of giants, which is all you guys, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, I also want to thank all these children that mapped a bunch of houses in Swaziland that I've been using in my model, and thanks to all the Italian people that made that happen. Um, OSRM, you guys are the homies, you made a really great routing engine. Um, OpenStreetMap Foundation sponsoring me to be here, and Maple Suite because they've inspired me so much um, with doing mapping. Yeah, and also all my homies in Swaziland because this is like seriously the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, this, yeah, the projects that we're working on, so super dope. If you want to check out more of our projects, go to eiabridges.org. Um, and yeah, this is me. Check me out on the web, GitHub, um, OSM, and Couchsurfing. I'm traveling through Europe. If you want to host me on your couch, it would be dope. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Thanks, that was super interesting. My question is, did you receive any pushback that you didn't expect when doing this project? Uh, hmm. Yes, well, they're very much, pretty much everyone told us that we couldn't do it um, at the beginning um, when we were trying to set up this program. I mean, we were really university students just figuring it out one step at a time. So we got plenty of people who told us we couldn't do it at the beginning. Um, but then once the ball started rolling, it was a bit of a, kind of just a project unto its own. Um, and now we're at the point where we're really well established within the government, we're really highly regarded, and the program's uh, you know, building and expanding. We're hiring a bunch of Swazis, and essentially they're running it on their own. I've eventually taught them all, um, a bunch of Swazis, how to do all of the work that I was doing. So it's now, you know, it's just the kind of the next level. So I would say we had pushback initially, but once you, once you bring people to one of these bridges, yeah, it's like, you know, it's a whole different level. Great. Are there any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi there, thanks for a very exciting presentation, cool project. Um, I have a technical question. Um, perhaps I missed it, but have I understood that uh, your, your metric of distance or time, that they are essentially interchangeable, that they are just a, a constant factor different? Or is there something that you do about terrain computation so that you account also for hill slopes of the trails that people need to walk? Yeah, that's a great question. So the default routing profile is what I use for the time metric, um, and the distance is just what it returns. You know, when you're when you look at the route and you just calculate the distance, you know, on the ground. But um, in particular, you're correct that uh, for a walking profile, it's really critical to have uh, elevation data in there. Um, and as you could see even on the example, uh, it shows various routes that are going down the hill and then back up. And you, you, you got to figure that that's not realistic. So um, it does not incorporate um, that elevation profile. but. The thing about it was, I mean, at the beginning of the project, I was like, yeah, I'll write my own routing engine. Sounds dope. I was like, man, I got way too deep into it, right? But that's why I built it around OSRM, because OSRM does have that functionality to incorporate raster elevation data in the uh, calculation that it makes for distance and time. And so um, I don't say I would use those interchangeably. Um, they're just uh, useful to understand when looking at, you know, I wouldn't use them both together, but I would use them separately, say, you're saving a certain amount of distance or a certain amount of time when we're talking to different stakeholders. Okay. Yeah, amazing work. Um, I may have a coach for you after. <laughs> Dope. Uh, <laughs> um, here's my question. Uh, it's some amazing stuff here, and you've thanked the community that you worked with. And I live in Canada, and for me to get high school students to do something in their own backyard similar to this is like pulling teeth. Have you thought about your experience working in these uh, so-called developing countries that we could benefit from, say, back in Denver, where they're looking at climate resiliency and other similar issues that they're dealing with? It's a super good question. So I will say when you're coalescing a community underneath a tangible infrastructure is really powerful because it's less of a vaporous idea, um, for instance, you know, as opposed to climate change, right? Um, and so I think a lot of the strength in our projects, I mean, we have people volunteering their labor entirely, um, for, you know, all day long um, for various weeks. And I think Unfortunately, it's like the motivation is so much stronger in these communities somehow than I see um, in, actually I did live in Denver as well at some point, you know, between people. Um, also, you gotta figure that the life in these homesteads, I mean, people are just chilling. I mean, they don't, they don't have nine to fives, they're not stressed, right? So it's really easier to motivate and organize and, you know, a, a project like this when people are, you know, also very starved for development, right? Because this, I mean, these are some of the nicest pieces of infrastructure 
infrastructure around. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have uh, off the top of my head and on the spot uh, a way that you could, you know, coalesce or s start something like this in, in, say, Denver. But I think it all comes down to really like making the people like believe like something that they can tangibly do, and then it's not such a just a vaporous idea of, of of telling them. And we actually do. When we start these projects, we actually bring the community leaders, we, we ask them to form a bridge committee, and we bring them to one of the other footbridges. And when they go back to their community, I mean, they just, you know, it's, it's just obvious to these people, like, once you can really show them the tangible results of them working together. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm wondering how do the results from your quantitative analysis um, filter into the prioritization process of deciding where to build the next footbridge? And in relation to that, how do you deal with like completeness of data? Like, um, how do you assess in which community you, like which percent of houses are actually mapped? Because this obviously um, has a big influence on your results. Thanks. Great questions. Um, so uh, to the last one, um, so actually, I, I, I'm sure you guys realized I talked really fast. I wasn't about to like shove some more stuff in that presentation, but actually in between when we first visit the Incunlas and then when we actually do the site visits, we run like a mapathon. By the way, that mapathon is usually just me, right? Um, but also really great is that um, these children have made a huge amount of buildings um, that are available in Eswatini. So um, these children at all, so actually, Typically, it's just me adding the route networks and the fords um, in order to do these studies, which is really manageable at scale as opposed to tracing all these buildings. Um, and actually, what was the first question? Got it. So also, you know, the benefit of our projects being like community-based initiatives, you know, we don't have like these crazy, you know, you know, four or five letter organizations that are, you know, really, you know, like we need proof or whatnot. Really, the biggest thing is, that, you know, and like I, you can do the data analysis like I showed, but really it's the visualizations to talk to these government people because, you know, people in Swazi, you're, like, you're just like, look at this, bro. And they're like, okay, yeah, we get it, right? And so really, more or less, we're proving it to ourselves. We're we're not really proving it to others because in the end we are the ones that are the driving forces behind these projects so it's really it, it comes out of our own internal desire to make these the most impactful it's not about proof for somebody else in order to kind of fund our projects or something like that that was a great question we maybe have time for a quick one before before we go to the lunch break yeah Just Hey, great talk, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, it's super important, obviously, to get kids to, kids to school, but were there other metrics as well, such as uh, farmers getting their crops to market and that sort of thing that were important to the analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if I understood the question correctly, it was just that, uh, you know, in this particular example, I used just, just one school, but there's other locations that people go to. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, for this visualization that I put on here, I wanted to make it really simple or else there would be just routes everywhere. But also, like I say, when we do the community, when we go to these uh, incunlas and we find all the POIs, it's actually more than just one destination that we're recording. Um, typically, it's schools and clinics and nearest towns slash public transport, that's like the top ones. Sometimes, you know, um, like spiritual healers and, and uh, football fields and things like that, but we do record all of these things together and they are a part of the analysis and visualizations that we make. I just simplified it for this particular example. Um, in the route comparison um, scenario, or, or sorry, the route comparison class that I've built, um, you know, it, it takes multiple destinations into account. Great. Thank you very much, Davey. I think we have to wrap it up at the stage.